It's a used stamp from Brazil that has made it onto the table for episode 5. All I can make out on the image so far are the tops of two palm trees, so let's remove the postmark and sharpen it up a bit. It's an illustration of a scene in the city of Rio de Janeiro. I can tell because of the recognizable sugarloaf mountain in the background. And well, it says Rio de Janeiro. Other than the palm trees in the foreground, the image seems to feature a bridge, which I'll look into further. The top of the stamp reads Brazil Correio, while the bottom has the value of 1200 reais. The postmark shows that this was sent as airmail and it has the date of the 8th of September 1941. The currency was the old Brazilian real that was in use until 1942 as this stamp was issued back in 1939. So I'm going to put this stamp to the side for now because Brazil has a philatelic claim to fame, uh, some postal history bragging rights that I need to address. And that is that it was the second country to issue a postage stamp. Uh, Britain was the first in 1840 with a penny black as we all know. Well, three years later in 1843, Brazil issues these three stamps, making it the second country to ever issue a postage stamp. Now, yes, a couple of local postage stamps were in use by 1842. Uh, New York City was using them, as well as the Swiss canton of Zurich. But this is the second time that a country adopted a flat rate and the adhesive postage stamp to use nationwide. And these little pieces of paper, known as the Brazilian bullseyes, proved that the concept of the adhesive postage stamp could work elsewhere, not just the UK. So the Brazilian Congress was looking for a way to reduce postal rates, and this was back in 1842, the year before these stamps were issued. And a gentleman by the name of Johann Jakob Sturz was a consul of Brazil in Europe, and he was paying attention to what the UK was doing. He was impressed with how the postage stamp was successful in addressing a number of postal challenges and providing economic benefits. Those challenges were the same challenges that everyone was dealing with at that time, and the reasons for why the UK adopted the adhesive postage stamp. One being lost revenue. A tremendous amount of revenue was lost because the recipient of the letter had to pay for the letter received instead of the sender. So the recipient could refuse to pay it if they couldn't afford it or if they just didn't want it. And never mind the fact that the letter had already made its journey. Another reason is because the postal rates were incredibly complex and expensive, with a key factor being distance, determining how much a letter costs. So with the size of Brazil in mind, sending a letter from one end to the other end of the country would have been outrageously expensive. So Johan wrote to his contacts in Brazil, urging that they adopt the UK's approach and make the sender pay for the letter in advance at a flat rate. It's believed that his influence led to Brazil issuing these stamps in August of 1843. The flat rate was 60 reais that would send anything under half an ounce or 15 grams anywhere in the country. The Brazilian people as well as the postal service benefited from the issuing of these stamps. Now it would cost me less to send something long distance but it would also now cost me more to send something very local, say within my own neighborhood. So I'm sure it temporarily discouraged the sending of letters within your own city but it ultimately brought down the average cost to send a letter within the country and therefore make communication within the large geography of Brazil more affordable. And also there was a lot less revenue lost as a result of the sender paying for the letter up front. 60 could get my letter anywhere in the country by land. Uh, if it was to go by ocean, it would cost 120, and therefore I would use two 60s. If it weighed a little more than half an ounce, it would cost 90, so the 30 was used along with the 60. Judiciary letters and circulars were half the rate, so they used the 30, and the 90 was generally used for international mail. Because of this structure, the 60 was the most printed, with over 1.5 million issued, the 30 had over 1.1 million, while the least printed was the 90, only 349,000. These were only issued for a year and it is unknown as to how many survive today. These stamps could have been stuck anywhere on the envelope, the placement didn't matter, and many of them actually got placed in a position that held the envelope together, acting as a seal. So therefore, when the envelope was opened, the seal would get broken and therefore torn and discarded. So these stamps are rare and they're highly sought after by philatelists. 
Now, I typically don't have a hard time finding information about stamps online, especially the iconic ones. So I was a little surprised to have a hard time with these Brazilian bullseyes. Don't know why. However, I do need to give a shout out to the American Philatelic Society, more specifically the American Philatelic Research Library, uh, because they pointed me to a number of resources uh, where I could learn about and read about these stamps, specifically the American Philatelist issued in July of 1943. Now, if you're a member of the American Philatelic Society, you have access to the American Philatelic Research Library, as well as all the past American Philatelist journals that have been printed. In this case, the July 1943 issue was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Brazilian bullseyes. And there is a solid article by L.G. Brookman that provided me with a lot of content to learn from. One particular piece of information that I was interested in is why is it known as the Brazilian bullseye and why does it look very different from the UK's first stamp? If you look at the two side by side, there's very little that is similar. The UK features the portrait of a monarch, a square border design with the words postage and the denomination written out. Whereas the Brazilian bullseye just features a number within an oval shape and that's really it. The one thing that is similar is that neither of them list the country name. Now, Brazil did actually consider putting the profile of the Brazilian emperor on the stamp. That's right, Brazil was actually the empire of Brazil and Emperor Dom Pedro II was in power. Now, the reasons why they chose not to put him on the stamp are quite interesting. The first one, which is the most interesting, is they saw it as distasteful to put the image of a leader or monarch on something that ends up getting thrown out in the trash. It was preferred to reserve their image for permanent objects such as paintings and statues, not on paper that gets cancelled with ink and then torn up and eventually thrown out. Another reason for not using the profile was forgery, or so it was suggested that by using the emperor's profile, it was going to have to be used over an extended period of time because it takes a great deal of effort to engrave these things, as well as the fact that his profile, the emperor's profile, is readily available to everybody. So forgers had the access and the time to do their work. The most likely and simplest explanation is that a very skilled engraver would be required to get a good representation of the monarch. Remember the Lepero issue from Mauritius? It wasn't exactly a spitting image of Queen Victoria, so you have to be careful. You need to get a skilled engraver to do the artwork. Bear in mind that these engraved images are not only really small, but they needed to be replicated on a plate up to 60 times in the case of the Brazilian bullseyes and six plates were produced. It's a lot of engraving and even with the most expert engraver at the time, the images were never identical. Therefore, the stamps can be traced back to the actual position on a plate from which it was printed, which essentially creates a fingerprint. And as a philatelist, you could specialize in one of the engraved issues and become an expert at identifying the subtleties between each stamp and plate and even identify forgeries. I bring this up because the July 1943 issue of the American Philatelist goes into a great level of detail about the different positions and plates of the Brazilian bullseyes. And it makes for a really interesting read. Now, in the later years, Emperor Dom Pedro II did show up on stamps starting in 1866 and all the way until 1884, long enough for his beard to go from black to white as he aged. So this makes me think that the Brazilian bullseyes did not include the emperor because they were worried about disrespect. It was more so about not having the technology available. These are fairly simple designs that yes, could be forged, but they were only around for one year because the following year, they were replaced with the slanted numeral series in 1844. And then in 1850, the numbers were no longer slanted and each of these had similar names thrown around such as goat size, cat size. So why were they called bullseyes? Well, these were issued in sheets of 54 and when you just look at two of them side by side, they apparently look like a set of bullseyes. I just love the names of philatelic icons. Usually it has a color, so the penny black, uh, the blue Mauritius, the one cent magenta, the tress killing yellow, the dull rose. Uh, but in the case of last episode, we had the missing virgin. And in this case, we have the Brazilian bullseyes. Flatless have always done really well at giving epic names to its legends. Well, that's my opinion. Here's a 1943 mini sheet issued by Brazil with the bullseyes celebrating their first stamp. And although it is valid for postage, they didn't come with gum, so they were really made for the philatelist. Notice that they are in centavos and not heais. And in the top left is Emperor Pedro II, while on the top right is the president of Brazil at the time in 1943, Hetulio Vargas. 
Brazil has also issued many beautiful stamps since its early days, but it is this one that I pulled from the box today. So what is this bridge that is featured? It's actually an old aqueduct known as the Carioca Aqueduct or Arcos de Lapas, the Arches of Lapa. When I think of the city of Rio de Janeiro, I think of beaches, the Sugarloaf Mountain, uh, the very large statue of Christ the Redeemer atop of Corcovado Mountain overlooking the city, but I don't think of an aqueduct, yet here it is featured on this stamp. It was built between 1706 to 1723 to address a water problem that the city of Rio had, poor access to fresh water. Rio was surrounded by swamps with bad quality water. The only way to get water suitable for drinking was to manually carry it from streams far away. So canals along with this ancient solution of an aqueduct was put in place. It played a vital role in delivering fresh water to the city's population, but was no longer needed by the late 1800s as other sources were being used. The introduction of pipes and pumps made the aqueduct redundant. So the aqueduct was transformed to carry a tram in 1896 and has been doing so since then, which technically means that it's no longer an aqueduct, it's actually a viaduct and is a beautiful piece of architecture in the center of the city. If you ever find yourself in Rio, look out for the structure. I didn't know about it and maybe you didn't know about it either, but we all know about it now thanks to a postage stamp. As always, thanks for watching. Remember to look out for bullseyes, emperors, and aqueducts. And of course, subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter where I post additional content. See you next time.